It was a really difficult day in court, and we're talking to our legal expert, LaTanya Hines, about all of the implications of this extremely strange case. We heard disturbing testimony from both the lead investigator and the medical examiner, leaving the jurors in tears. I mean, these jurors were weeping as they were sitting in the jury box, so upset by what they heard. And then possibly the most bizarre part of this entire case, they said, all right, prosecution rests, time for the defense to take it up. What are you going to do? And she said, nothing. I have no defense. I'm not going to present any arguments in my own favor. That's it. Case over. And what are you thinking as you're watching this and she's deciding not to defend herself at all? I, it's kind of like I said before, this either is the most genius defense or it's just the most confounding. And I think for the jurors, they're sitting there and even though there has been no evidence at all about some type of diminished capacity or anything, mm -hmm. You can't help but think that they're thinking something's wrong with her. Right. It's, well, it's bizarre to watch her sit there. And at one point today, the judge was asking her questions saying, you know, what's going on here? What are you wanting to talk to me about? And she like giggled. And it was just this incredibly weird demeanor for the fact that she's in a murder trial. I mean, she's facing the death penalty and she's standing up there giggling. It was really weird. Right. But once again, we go back to what a juror probably is thinking. What? sane person would do this? What sane person, first of all, would do this to a child? Second, what person would be sitting there and representing themselves mm -hmm. and put no evidence for it? Now, you've got to remember, a, a, a defendant doesn't have to ever introduce any evidence. It's right. all up to the state to prove the case. So do you think in her mind she's thinking the state hasn't proved the case, so I'm not going to say anything? I don't think that's the case at all. I think the issue is that both she and the husband there's something obviously not normal about them. But we're not in a case where we're saying that they are not legally competent. They're competent. Oh, they're definitely they're competent. competent. I mean, she was asking questions. She was very... Um, but she never asked a question of him. Oh, that's a very good she point. Never made, she never asked a question of him. They haven't seen each other in all this time. She stared at him. And then look at his own demeanor. You've got jurors who don't know anything about this child who cried more than the father who was on the stand talking about what he and his uh, wife did or did not do for this child. Right. And I do want to address some issues here because people are saying, Let's go back, back to the beginning here. Take me to the background of this case. This is a murder trial where 10-year-old Amani Moss was starved to death. Her body was then burned, um, allegedly by her father and her stepmother. Her father has pled guilty to felony murder. He's serving life without parole. The only way he escaped the death penalty was by agreeing to testify against his wife. When he took the stand, he said, yep, that's my wife. They're still legally married. And he did testify against her, but Latonia, if you listen to that part of the testimony, it's not like he threw her under the bus. He was more matter of fact. He did say, you know, she told me not to call 911, but he didn't disparage her. He didn't call her a bad person. He didn't say she was horrible. Well, I don't think you have to, you don't have to call her anything. He described the fact that she's like, no, we can't call 911. Mm -hmm. He describes the fact for five days this child was in that house. Like, the way that he just described everything. It I was, mean, it was sick. She was complicit with it. And right. not only was she complicit with it, when he called to tell her that, hey, I've called the, you know, I'm going to call 911, mm -hmm. her lack of response, oh, you know, I mean. Like it's, watching television. Yes. Yeah. And one of the legal questions we kept getting this afternoon was she. I mean, at the last hour, decides she wants to consult her standby counsel. She had been representing herself. She had two public defenders who were appointed to be her standby counsel, be there in case she wants. Last day, she decides, yes, I want to consult you. And so she asked the judge to meet behind closed doors. The judge said, well, why do you want to meet? And she really stuttered. She couldn't give a good answer. She said, I want to talk about something now that matters later. I don't know if you can read those tea leaves or discern anything of what that means, but then they did. They went into a closed door session. It was just her, her public defenders and the judge. The district attorney couldn't attend. And nobody knows what they talked about because the judge said he decided not to take any action. Right. Well, I mean, she has a right. Ultimately, we're in the defendant's case, and she has a right to decide how that case should go forward. And so. It's still absolutely strange that now, when you had the opportunity to have introduced evidence, mm -hmm. you never did, but now you want to try to get something before the judge. Um, I think the judge did the right thing in having the 
attorneys go back in, in uh, closed doors to talk with her to see what it, what it was that she was trying to introduce or do. It could be that maybe something she wanted to talk to them about was something that she hadn't discussed with the attorneys. But see, because she's representing herself, maybe it was something that she wanted to get out there, but she didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And she's not cooperating with the people who are there with her, or she doesn't want to listen to what their advice is in getting it done. Well, you could tell those public defenders who have been appointed were ready. I mean, the moment she called on them, this one man leapt out of his seat to defend her, and he was citing case law. He was, I mean, just ba 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 to the judge. You could tell they're prepared, they're ready to help, oh, and she won't allow it. So here's the deal. Whenever you're an attorney on a case like this, and especially because they're being in standby, they're, they're ready this case as if this was their own case. They may even have their own thought process about what the defenses should be. Wow. Um, but ultimately, she's in the driver's seat for this. It's unbelievable. A lot of people are asking questions right now about her father and his culpability. Aman Moss is the biological father of Amani. He did plead guilty, but some people are making the point he had two or three jobs, he wasn't around very much, he wasn't the primary caretaker, but in the eyes of the law, he's just as culpable. Well, not only is he just as culpable, we've heard the, the evidence of the fact that there has been prior abuse and mm -hmm. convictions of that abuse uh, with regard to her, and we, and she was brought back into this home. So he knows the situation that she's living under. So he is, is just as culpable. Not only that, if look at his own testimony yesterday. Um, he may have had multiple jobs, but he testified about, I thought that if we set her on fire, it would be something like a cremation. I mean, yeah, that, that was, it was just, it was just sick. so surreal and bizarre to think that these two people, and if we go back to the father, this is the biological father. You mm -hmm. see what's happening to your child. This wasn't the first incident with regard to this abuse, but you do nothing. And what I found really unsettling was that, I mean, uh, Tiffany Moss, we heard testimony today that she sent a text message and said, Amani has passed. I mean, your daughter is dead. He doesn't leave work. He stays at work to finish his shift. He comes home, I guess, checks to see that she is gone. He said her essence had left. And then he goes to his second job. It, right. He carries so, so, on as if so nothing here, happened. Once again, it tells you something about these two people. All right, they are not operating on the same normal compass. Mm -hmm. Okay, as most people, for him to be able to hear that and do nothing, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's just, it's, it's indicative of their relationship the whole entire time. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Something happens to this kid, but he does nothing to help he out. He does nothing. Yeah, and Linda's asking right now, why didn't the family help? Eyes can see this child only weighed 32 pounds. According to the testimony of the paternal grandmother, she was kept away from Amani. So Amani passed away in October. The last time she saw this little girl was in May. And so the other thing that, to be noted too, when she was in school, some of the school uh, caretakers, uh, some of the teachers and things who are considered mandatory reporters, mm -hmm. they reported the issues that they saw, especially when they saw the welts and everything. Right, right. But here's what happened. She, they was, she was taken out of uh, school. She was homeschooling. So, I mean, who's there right. regulating that? I mean, you've got to give credit to the grandmother, the paternal grandmother in this case, because she tried for so many years to try to do what she could do to get custody of this child. She knew something wasn't right. She knew that her son wasn't a good parent for the child, and she mm. knew definitely that Tiffany wasn't a good parent. Right. And she tried everything she could legally. Right, and even the paternal aunt, Amani's aunt, she called defects when they said they were gonna start homeschooling Amani. She said, it just didn't add up, it didn't make sense. Tiffany has two very young children at home. She said, I'm a mom myself. I can't imagine with two young children homeschooling a third child. So she called defects, she reported it. And they asked, you know, what came of that report? Nothing. Well, here's the thing too, you'll notice and sometimes in some of these abuse cases, when there's multiple children, mm -hmm. sometimes there's a focused child. There's a child that is the focus of the abuse. Um, and some of the other children may never get it, but that kid is the focus of the abuse. And, that and it seems was like in this situation, you sort of took care of the other kids. I mean, you're, you're going out while you've got a dead Bonnie in the mm -hmm. car. You, you, but this child, for whatever reason, this child seemed to lack to get the regular care that you would do for any human being or even any animal. 
Right. And that's what the district attorney compared it to a Cinderella case gone wrong. He said, all you have here is an evil stepmother. And the other two children were cared for. Tiffany Moss's biological children, they testified today, they were well fed, they were well clothed, they were polite, they acted very normally. And she's allegedly starving this other child but to so death. So here's the part that I would disagree a little bit about Danny mm -hmm. and the way his approach about Cinderella. Mm -hmm. In Cinderella, you had a loving father in right. that case as well, right? He right. cared a lot for his child and then right. his stepmother comes in. You've got this situation where this is the this father's biological child and he is agreeing with the stepmother to treat this child like lesser than any animal. Yeah, no, that's true. When he went out to buy the garbage can to burn her body in, he bought diapers for his other two children on that same shopping trip. And that was like, it's some of the stuff you hear, you just cannot wrap your brain because around the fact and, that this is happening. And, and what you gotta hope for as a prosecutor is that the, when the jurors are listening to this, they're not looking at it and thinking to themselves and building in this whole insanity defense that mm -hmm. she hasn't even put up there, just thinking to themselves that, only a crazy person would do this. Only a crazy right. person would do this. So even though she hasn't said anything, Correct, they're listening because, to the testimony saying, they're thinking saying, to themselves, no way. They're thinking to themselves, what sane person would do this? What sane person would represent themselves? Because it's almost like she's, she's in a way, getting herself out of the death penalty. Mm. But sometimes they're yeah. just people who are just evil. And I do have to say, a lot of the legal experts I was talking to who were at court today said the very same thing what jury is going to send someone to death who hasn't given her side of the story? So it's not like they heard her side of the story and decided you deserve the death penalty for what you've done. They've heard nothing from her. So their argument is it would be really difficult for the jury to yeah, say, okay, I we're think it's, you. I think that, I, you know, um, Danny is a great uh, prosecutor and he has done a great job in the research and doing this case and putting the case up there. But it's almost an impossible situation where you've got regular people, as we call lay people, who are sitting there and they're listening to this day in and day out and looking at this person, they have nothing to hear from her, mm -hmm. but because they have nothing to hear from her and they see her sitting there that whole entire time, they're thinking to themselves, this just doesn't make any sense. Right. There's right. got to be something wrong with this person. And I think that might be very hard for them to do, to, to react. How do you overcome that as a prosecutor, as an attorney? I mean, I think it's very hard. I think that Danny's doing a great job in like going over here's the case, here's what happened, these are the elements I've got to prove, and it is what it is. And what he's got to do is turn the dialogue from the idea that maybe something's wrong with her. And maybe it's like, there's nothing wrong with her. She just does not care. She was just such an apathetic person. She did not care anything about her child. She didn't care about the child, and this is where we are. So the two kind of dueling theories here are, you know, that A, she's, she's apathetic, she doesn't care, or B, that this is somehow a strategy, that she is... And so here's the thing, I don't know that it is a truly, like, a strategy of her own. I mean, I don't know if she's that diabolical that she's come up with this ingenious strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she's just off. I don't think she's crazy as we call legally crazy, but obviously she and the relationship that they, she had with her husband was something off. was just well, off. Well, Latasha's agreeing you, with you right there. She said, everybody was off to me. So yeah. it, it did seem like there was a weird... Right, and if you look at it, like if you, the case that's, I think it's out of California, where you've got the two parents who had all of these kids that were locked up, these, mm. you know, had to, you know, um, call 911, escape to do it. They were underfed, all of those mm. other things. Both parents were not, they weren't legally insane, Mm -hmm. but they were not right. They were right. abnormal. Right. They something were, was something off. was off with them. Yeah. And so sometimes you may even have to buy into the idea that maybe there's a legal, there's not a legal definition for it, but just morally. Some people are just morally corrupt. Some people are just evil. And maybe that's, that's what, that's what you've got to have a juror believe mm -hmm. in this case, that this person is just such an evil person. They have no appreciation for life and that they intentionally did this to this person to go with that death penalty. Wow, and I thought it was weird that she didn't question her own 
mother and her own sister when they took the stand. Because in my mind, they would be the most sympathetic people for her if she wanted to somehow appear more sympathetic or trustworthy to the jury, that those would be the two people that she would question. Or and is, she said nothing. Right, but, or is it? I mean, this is the part that's hard for all of us, like the legal minds are to, to wrap around and, to, or is it she just doesn't care? Right, then that's, she just that's hard care. to wrap your mind around. Maybe she's You're just right. sitting there and she just doesn't care, or maybe in her mind she just figured out, you know what, it's all right. Either she has no appreciation of life whatsoever, like what she had no appreciation of money, she has no care what happens to her, or she just believes, I'm going to get out of this. And I think she, she did make a statement before the trial began that she was leaving it to God. And so she felt like that was going to be her defense going through this. I did want to ask you about the interaction between she and her husband. When he was up on the stand, what was your impression of what she was doing and if they were communicating at all? I, mean, I guess the problem that we don't really have is more information about what the dynamics was with their relationship mm, just yeah. from the get-go. What was that dynamic like? Obviously, it was... A, an abnormal dynamic between two people, right? Mm -hmm. That you would have somebody abusing your child and you'd be okay with it and not doing anything. But there was not really any interaction. Right. There no. was not really any interaction whatsoever. And that was the part that I wanted to see. But what was strange also is I thought that maybe father, you know, you've worked out this deal, mm -hmm. that father would be on the stand and as he's describing when he said, well, I thought that it would work out like, you know, a cremation when I went to go burn her body. No emotion. And no emotion. The fact to me that they <laughs> took their other two children with them yes. to go do this. Yes. I mean, it is, it's, it's beyond comprehension. Right, and it makes you, and I think as if you're a juror, it's, it, it almost might make you start thinking to yourself, this person deserves the death penalty too. So Aaliyah's asking, she's setting herself up for an appeal for inadequate representation. How does that work on the back end? So here's what happens. That is the most common um, defense uh, appeal. That is the most common appeal, is to say ineffective assistance a counsel, okay. right? And that's the reason why the judge has made sure that he has made sure that there are attorneys there. There are two attorneys there who are just regular trial attorneys. And there's also an appeals attorney, death penalty appeals attorney there. Um, the judge also does a colloquy and he's done that and we've seen that where he's going to ask the question, you want to represent yourself? You have this assistance here. Do you want to testify? He goes through all of these things. You're aware that you have this right. But in the end, she's still, this is still probably going to be, an, if she is indeed convicted mm -hmm. and there is an appeal, that will be the number one uh, reason. So I was on Twitter talking about this case and when she wrote the letter to the judge and then they went behind closed doors and the judge came out and said, I'm not going to do anything. That's where people started saying, oh, now there's gonna be an appeal because she asked for something and she didn't get any ruling. Right, so we don't know what it was, right? She didn't really ask for something because if she truly asked for something, it would be on the record, here's what we've asked for, right? And there's legal ways to be able to ask for some type of relief. You can file a motion for something. And she has the assistance of these attorneys here for purposes of being able to try to help her do that. Right. Um, but she's decided, like it seems like in most of her life, to make the decisions about everything. Um, and she made this decision about this letter. And the letter could be something that's totally irrelevant, that it doesn't make, it's not something that would be admissible, even if she wanted to testify or say something. What her testimony is may be something that would be considered irrelevant. Right. Star is asking here, where's her biological mother? So I did ask the district attorney about that because we hadn't heard much about her. The district attorney told me she surrendered Amani's parental rights at birth and that she had five bi biological children. She surrendered her rights to each of those children and she's not involved in their life at all. So I had thought at first, are they gonna call her? Is, is she gonna be involved in this way in any way? No, but we did have when there was an incident, I believe between Tiffany Moss and the biological mother for which she got, uh, I think, either charged or arrested um, for beating up on that, that biological mother. Oh. And Imani was there for that, in the presence of when that happened, and so there was a cruelty charge as well. Oh, so, yes, yeah, so I think that was part of the reason why she was put on probation. Oh, yeah, so it, we don't it. know much more about that, but we do know there's been some type of interaction between physical interaction between um, the biological mother and uh, Tiffany. Yeah, she wasn't involved in the case at all, and I think the 
the most compelling character is the paternal grandmother. The who paternal grandmother wanted so desperately to get custody. If, if there was anything that, if if there was any case where you want to look at how our um, DCF program works, or something where you're saying, hey, this is an example of um, we might need to retool something. This is it mm -hmm. because. The other thing too is grandparents don't have a lot of rights, uh, right. legal rights yeah. um, in this. And so she tried everything that she could. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that I always keep reiterating is she tried everything she could to get custody of this child, right? She even had like temporary custody right. when, when there was this um, battery charge. And the only time she truly got custody of this child is once she was dead to deal with the estate. It's just like, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, like so, it's so awful to even, even think about that. Well, it's awful because what you, I think what reaches out to everybody about this case is that it's such an emotional thing because you think to yourself, this poor child, so short period of time of being alive, and you even heard one of the teachers, one of the um, education people tell you who was crying on the stand about how sweet she was. She endured such torture, and the torture she endured was at the hands of the people who were supposed to be taking care of her. It's, it's sick. That's awful. And I did want to ask you, too, about the strategy going forward. So Monday morning, you're going to have closing arguments. I don't know if Tiffany Moss is going to say anything. It doesn't seem like she will. So if you're Danny Porter, how do you approach that, knowing this is going to be it? Danny Porter does his job. Mm -hmm. As a prosecutor, you still do your job because ultimately she doesn't ever have to say anything because mm -hmm. the burden of proof is on the, um, is on the, the prosecution. And so... First of all, she can't argue anything that's not in evidence, so she can't argue anything new. She can't bring in new evidence. <laughs> she, in. Yeah, how would she, she even can't, do that? She, yeah. can't, she can't now say, try to start testifying, right. because she had that opportunity to do so. It'll be interesting over the weekend, if maybe in some thought process, and it'll be, maybe she talks with her attorneys. Even though the case is closed, will there be some extraordinary measure taken up where they allow it to open? again for the defense. That would be fascinating if they did that. And I know that she was able to meet with her attorneys, so they were in the holding cell and they did they did meet together. But then nothing changed when she came back out. She still said she wasn't gonna call any witnesses, she wasn't gonna testify in her own defense. Yeah, I but you just never know. I don't know, because I don't know what the strategy, I don't know what the thought process is that's going on here. How could you, I mean, I can't imagine being that attorney who's sitting behind someone who's, you know, in terms of legal. So I've had cases, like I've had cases even in, in like a smaller type of case, like a, a DUI, where somebody believes that they can represent themselves better, and they have an attorney, and they say that they want to represent themselves. And sometimes you'll have the situations where you have somebody who started out with an attorney. The attorney says, I, my client is not wanting to listen to my um, direction. And, you know, attorney can also cannot, you know, suborn perjury and say, judge, can I be removed from the case? The judge is like, no, you've been on this for this point in time. But what I will do is, she, this person wants to represent themselves, you'll stand by for help. But oh, I've okay. seen in the cases, and I mean, uh, we've had a, uh, Cobb had a case as well where I believe it was a stalking, I think it got, I want to make sure I got the names right, I think it's Dakar, but um, he wanted to represent himself. He was, uh, if you may recall him um, some years ago, he uh, was stalking um, this woman. He goes to uh, the house, she's not there, he kills the roommate instead. He represented himself at trial, but the attorneys, and on some levels the attorneys are kind of held hostage, they're over to the side. They are there to have um, any law that needs to happen, any motion to help them figure out how to do it. So if she wanted to introduce this letter, mm -hmm. if she would have done so, she would have talked to the attorneys ahead of time so they could help figure her figure out, out how, how to do, do it. it. Um, Anita's asking, when are we going to hear what happens? Um, likely Monday. We know that there's going to be closing arguments Monday. They figured out what the charge to the jury was going to be today, so both sides agreed to it. They'll, the judge will read the charge to the jury on Monday morning after closing arguments are made. So Danny Porter definitely is going to say something, the district attorney in Gwinnett County, whether or not Tiffany Moss says anything. I know, and, what's, and, and that's kind of like the loose cannonball. You just never know if she's going to say anything, and what is she going to say, right? Because th she's very limited on what she can argue at this mm -hmm. point. She can only argue about the evidence that has been already placed in, mm -hmm. and she can either make the argument that the state didn't prove their case, which 
It would be hard. It'd yeah. be hard. Or she sits there and once again she does nothing. Wow. That's I this case is really mind blowing. Um AJ's asking where was DFAX and they were involved at some point. Um, Tiffany Moss was charged with, charged and convicted of child abuse for an incident where she beat Amani with a belt. Amani came to school, I mean, covered in welts, and she was found guilty on that. She was charged with child abuse. She was on probation, and Amon Moss, the biological father, testified that that was why Tiffany kept saying, don't call police, don't call police, because I'm on probation. I can't go to jail. I can't lose custody of my other children. Right, and also, um, and he also testified that they had to do, so usually DFACS will do something um, like this. They have their own investigation, which is separate to the criminal case, and they'll have something where they open up a file. Um, they will do something like a, a reuni reuni oh yeah, gosh, a unifying type plan of the parents. And they will also do like a parenting plan and that they're supposed to follow these things, do some type of uh, counseling, whatever else. And once those things are done and they believe it's okay, then they will close the file. So these files got closed. Some of these things got closed um, with regard to the child. And, and, it's, and it's sad. I mean, I don't want to totally you know, go off on DCF. I mean, I think they do as much as they can. Um, but in this case... This is the case, and, and I think DCF also felt this as well because some of the people who were directly involved, um, I believe their, their employment were terminated after they did an investigation. Wow. Um, someone's asking here if Dad took a plea deal. Yes, he took a plea deal to get the death penalty off the table. He took life without parole, so he would right. be in jail Correct. for the rest of his and life. So for most people who, where you know without a doubt, that the person did the offense, kind of like what happened with Brian Nichols, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. you remember Brian Nichols with the courthouse shootings around here? He was on a trial for a death penalty case, um, and he gets a defense, even though we know he's the one who did it. Well, what's the best result for somebody who's representing somebody with those type mm -hmm. of facts? The best result is to get life without the possibility of parole, wow. because you've yeah. now saved your client. So in here, we have a death penalty case where it's pretty certain about what right. happened. Right. Um, and he took this plea mm -hmm. for purposes to save his life. And I mean, he was just like, I mean, almost like a robot when he was reading what happened. It was, I mean, it, it was, was so bizarre. So when, bizarre. Because what I go back to is this, this was your child. This is your child. You, you even know at, you know that you had responsibility in the death, responsibility for where there was lack of omission and the disposal of this body. But the people who did not know your child, who were strangers, had more emotion about what happened to your child than what you did, and you were the one who were a part of it. It is, it's, it was sick. Watching that was sick. And I didn't cover his plea deal when he accepted the plea, but I heard during that hearing, at least, he did display some emotion. From what I understand, he was crying and saying, my baby, my baby, but I, I wasn't there when that so happened. So here, here, and here's the thing, and, and, and just hearing that, that's, that's probably the appropriate emotion that he probably should have shown, but it would have been great if he would have shown that while Amani was alive. Yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. I just, I thought it was bizarre that, I mean, when he was, it's like almost some of these things, it's like, I don't even want to say them on television. It's so awful. It's like, it's so awful. And he's just describing it like he's reading the phone book. Like, no big deal. Yeah, I, it, it, it is one of the most perplexing things. And I think sometimes it makes one think, and I think somebody just said this, we're talking oh, about it. We got to cut to TV real quick. Starving her 10-year-old stepdaughter, Amani, today, and she is representing herself in this case where she now faces the death penalty. So many of you have been following our live streaming coverage, and Caitlin Ross has been covering the trial for us. She is in the newsroom right now doing a Facebook Live answering your questions along with Latonia Hines, who is a prosecuting attorney in Cobb County. Caitlin? There are so many questions about this case. People cannot wrap their minds around what happened. And the question I keep hearing over and over and over again is since Tiffany Moss has said nothing, she has not defended herself at all, is she going to get a mistrial here? I, I don't think it's going to be a mistrial because somebody would need to 
make a motion for that. And <laughs> she's not making any motion. So I don't think you have that. But what I do think that might happen is that it's going to be very hard for jury maybe to say that, you know what, we're going to we'll convict her, she'll be found guilty, and then the death penalty. Because you've got to remember, it's a two-phase process, right? The person is convicted, and then they have a death penalty phase about whether or not that person's going to get the death penalty. And I think on some levels, I think they're sitting there, and they're watching this, and they're thinking to themselves, there is something wrong with this person. And even though there's been no evidence whatsoever of any mental issues or anything, they're probably sitting there thinking to themselves, who but somebody who is not there, somebody who is crazy, somebody who is mentally off, would have done what happened here and then not represent themselves, then to represent themselves. Well, we're going to hear closing arguments on Monday. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And certainly we'll be checking back with her afterwards to try and make sense of this totally horrifying case. To hear the key testimony. So we're back on Facebook Live now and just wanted to answer a few more questions. What do you think is still outstanding about this case? What do you think jurors are going to be thinking over the weekend? I think they're just confounded. I mean, it, it's so emotional. I think for those people who have young children or people who have grandkids who they're either going to put themselves somewhat in the place of the grandmother, they're going to look at their children and just think to themselves, what person would do this? What person would, you know... I mean, they shouldn't think like that, but I think somewhere in their heads, I mean, I think that might be going on in their heads. Someone in the comment section just said, I don't want to see another Casey Anthony. Do you think there's any way she so gets here's, off? So here's the difference, okay, and, and I've, I've done um, discussions about the Casey Anthony case. The difference with Casey Anthony is you had no idea of when all these things happen, mm -hmm. right? You, you were taking a lot for a juror, a regular person who's sitting there in um, the thought process about making a deliberation of guilt or, in a, you know, or not guilty about somebody, they had to jump so many hoops to make it to that guilty. Here, we don't have that. We don't have it where you're not sure how the child died. You're not sure of when the child died. You're not sure who truly had direct contact with the child. Here, we don't have that. The difference is here is that, one, we know that it was at the hands of the right. neglect from and the, the abuse of her parents. We know that not only did they not try to get any help for the child, once the child was dead, they tried to, um, to cover conceal it up, the death, yeah. conceal the death in such a horrific way. Mm -hmm. um, so you know this evidence, and the prosecution has laid it out very well. And um, some other people here commenting, you know, her mother and sister, they didn't have any remorse either. And I did notice that when they were on the stand. They really didn't show any remorse. They didn't seem to show much care for Imani. When the prosecutor was asking, did you ever see Imani? They were like, eh, no. I mean, it wasn't, there was no emotional investment there at all. So, and it maybe just speaks to the family dynamic. Maybe that family dynamic is that way. Maybe they, you know, they're not a very emotional family. I don't know. But they weren't the ones who spent the most time with her. It seems the paternal uh, grandmother was the one who spent more time. Right. And she, she wasn't, um, paternal grandmother was not emotional on the stand, but certainly as she's been watching the trial, I mean, it's been horrific. And you can watch, watch and her. you could see yeah. her and yeah. And I think the thing of it is too, you've got to remember that this happened, I believe in 2011, 13. Yeah. Sorry, 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 2013. I'm sorry about the one. Sure I get the dates. Yeah. So it's a while ago and she's lived this over and over again. And so there's a point where, where, you know, she's doing what she needs to do for purposes of making sure that the facts are known. Right. But mm -hmm. I would not call her apathetic. Oh, no. I did not think she was apathetic, um, especially what we know, what she tried to do to tr try to help this child. Right. I was more disturbed. I think I'm, I might have been more disturbed by the father's testimony than maybe even the lack of testimony by Tiffany. It, it was one of the most jarring things I've ever seen. Um, we do have to wrap this up, but I just wanted to ask you lastly, what do you think is going to happen Monday? I don't know. I mean, it's been a very kind of unusual trial. I think that Danny Porter, like I said, I mean, he's a very um, experienced prosecutor. I think he's going to do his part in getting, uh, doing his closing arguments and everything like that and summing up the evidence that's gone through. The other thing you've got to remember, those jurors are going to get that evidence back there, such as pictures and all of those things and so that's something that is also very nothing was done to stop that from coming in so those right. jurors are going to be looking They're at that. See all of that it'll be interesting to see if there's some last minute motion 
of some sort. We might see something Monday morning. We might morning. see a last minute motion. Maybe there is a motion for a mistrial at that point. We don't know. How long do you think it's going to take the jurors to return a verdict? I don't know, because I think it's very hard on this. Like I said, mm -hmm. this is a two-phase type of situation. Right. Um, on some levels, we think it's very evident what happened mm -hmm. and, you know, what we think the conclusion is going to be. But, you know, they've got a lot of evidence to go through, too, as well, mm -hmm. and making decisions. Right, and 12 strangers in a room, I mean. Right, and they've got to also make some decisions about intent, mm -hmm. right? Because right. all of these have something to do with intent, and they're going to have to either use the lack of evidence maybe right. on some levels to make their decision about intent as well. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the testimony today certainly went to intent and just calculation. Correct. And that's I mean, you say hard for Tiffany Moss to overcome, but I don't know that she's going to try to overcome anything. I don't think she that's what I'm saying about this. This is the reason why this is on some levels. I don't think she is in, intentionally being ingenious, but on some levels it's almost like an ingenious defense by doing nothing. 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 And because I, it builds in this idea, something must something must be wrong with her. Yeah, and um, I just want to end it on Latasha's comment here. I think this is so insightful. How am I crying? And they're not. Correct. And that's the part where you just think to yourself, this poor child, when a child is born, it is the parents that are supposed to be the ones who protect them, to keep them and rear them and everything. And the two people who are there for this, not only did they not do it, they did it in the worst way. They deprived her of everything and they deprived her of life. But yet they show no emotion. Now, think about it, even when these medical um, examiners uh, are testifying, mm -hmm. even when the pictures are coming in, nothing. 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 It was it was bizarre. We'll be in the courtroom on Monday morning. We're going to have full coverage. We'll also, I'm sure, be bringing you back to talk a little bit more about this after we have a verdict. And the penalty phase, I'm sure, is going to be just as interesting to see what happens here. So please weigh in. If you have questions, send us a message. Latonia is so accessible and always willing to answer your questions. So if you have questions, we're happy to address those, and we will definitely keep covering this case. Thank you.